So we're delving right into the actual text, word by word, in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. We looked at the word apostle. The chapter begins with, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. So uh, the first word, the word apostle designates Paul as an appointed messenger of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. Evidently, the office of apostle that Paul holds by the will of God has to do with being a specifically appointed messenger, apostle for Jesus Christ, as opposed to all believers who are messengers of our Lord in a general sense. The absence of the article with the word rendered apostle emphasizes having the office and characteristics of apostle of Christ Jesus through the will of God. The immediate appearance of the phrase Paul, and there's just it says apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and the epistle makes its declaration especially significant. This doesn't say the apostle, just says Paul, apostle. Just let's quick take a quick look at it. Paul. Next word, apostle. Doesn't say an apostle or the apostle. So the immediate appearance of the phrase Paul, apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and the epistle makes its declaration especially significant, one which authenticates the supreme value of the letter to its readers as coming from God through his chosen apostle, messenger, Paul. Yeah, was, I think I did a study on this. Yep, the word apostle. You may want to check into that, wherever it appears. So, Paul, apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. We have manuscript evidence. Some apostle of Christ Jesus, and some apostle of Jesus Christ. The, uh, the TR, Christus Receptus, Sinaiticus, AFG, Psi, 1739, of Jesus Christ, Westcott Hort, and NU, uh, P46, B, D, P33, and so on, have Christ Jesus. The TR text in a number of manuscripts transpose Christ Jesus to Jesus Christ, but this order is not characteristic of Paul in his epistles. When identifying his position in the opening verses of his epistles, he calls himself an apostle of Christ Jesus. A number of places here we see, so on. So, minor, minor difference here, but we all know uh, the meaning of this. The phrase Christ Jesus has an emphasis on the word rendered Christ, pointing to his deity and his anointed purpose from God when he took on the form of humanity with a view to his atonement for the sins of the whole world. So the Greek word Christo and the phrase Christos and the phrase and Christos, Christo Iesu, rendered in Christ Jesus in the YLT. It gets literally correct according to manuscript evidence that's more proficient. It comes from the Greek word Creo, meaning contact, to smear, to rub, to anoint, or joyously bestow. Creo is used to refer to anointing with oil for a particular purpose, such as being appointed to some position or office or function. The Greek word Christos, rendered Christ, comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach, meaning the anointed one, one which is given in Scripture and assigned usage meaning in Scripture, which refers to the Messiah, Savior, ruler of all the nations of the world in the kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom of God, who is to come into the world in the form of humanity as an Israelite to deliver Israel and mankind from the bondage of sin unto residence in the eternal kingdom of God for those who trust in him for it. So it's a Real honor to have that title, and only one has it. Look at Psalm 2, 1 and 12. Why do the nations rage, and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, Mashiach, the anointed one, Christu, in Christ, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. 
Then he shall speak to them in his wrath, and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy mountain, my holy hill of Zion, Jerusalem, and I will declare the decree. The Lord has set me, said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. They think they can oppose him like it's nothing. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. The psalmist asks why, in the sense of the futility of it, the nations of the world are in a rage. The peoples of the world, the kings and the rulers in the earth, vainly plot and take counsel together and set themselves against the Lord and his anointed. This is vanity, especially in view of God's almighty power and sovereignty. The Lord's anointed is his chosen one to be ruler of Zion. In other words, the people of Israel. His chosen people with David, the first king in view in Psalm 2, 2 and 6. The psalmist declares that the kings and rulers of the earth in their rebellion against God and his anointed are saying, Let us break their bonds in peace and cast away their cords from us. The rulers, peoples, kings, and rulers of the world, the nations, peoples, kings, and rulers of the world, were evidently aware of the Lord and his anointed ruler of the people of Zion. They were enraged and consorted with one another to defeat God's sovereignty over them. It was their view that they were in bondage to the Lord and his king. Psalm 2, 2 to 3. But the psalmist declares that the Lord in heaven will laugh and hold them in derision. He will speak to them via his wrath and distress them by action that reflects his deep displeasure. Psalm 2, 4 to 5. The Lord declares that he has set his anointed king on his holy hill, Zion. Psalm 2, 6. The word Zion here refers to Jerusalem, which indicates that the Lord's chosen people are Israelites, whose anointed chosen one is their king, Zion, was originally a Canaanite city, which was being conquered by David. The name Zion later on was used to refer to the temple area and then to the entire city of Jerusalem. The term holy hill is a synonym for the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And the Lord declares that his anointed chosen one has been begotten of God as his son. In view of the fact that physical sonship is not reversible, so much the more is sonship to God irrevocable, and more so it is eternal because God is eternal. So when we became sons of God by faith alone, John 1, 12 to 14, that's irreversible. God goes on to say to his anointed, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. The phrase, you are my son, in Psalm 2.7, comes from the Davidic covenant, 2 Sam 7.14. It is appropriated in Psalm 2 to show the legitimate God-ordained right of the king to rule. The phrase, today I have begotten you, refers to the day of the one being anointed, chosen by God, to be king of Israel, i.e. the day of the coronation of the king, and his adoption as a son of God into the family of God in an eternal life familial relationship with God. It is implied that the anointed king of Israel, being declared to be a son of God, a son of God, has the reception of eternal life and will receive an eternal kingdom of inheritance to rule the nations to the ends of the earth in a future kingdom of eternal kingdom. This also implies that the rebellion of the nations of the world toward the Lord and his anointed will finally be put down. In view of the lack of complete fulfillment of the prophecies in verse, verses 1 through 9, through King David or any king after him so far, the context must jump way out, way out of the time of David to a future king of Israel, the anointed one, the Christ from the Greek, O Christos, who will inherit the nations of the world and the ends of the earth, evidently as an eternal inheritance and possession. So the future anointed of God, the Christ, 
will meet the enraged nations, peoples, kings, and rulers of the world in conflict, and break them with a rod of iron, and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel, despite the warning of the Lord through the psalmist in verses 10 to 12. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the, in the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Notice that individuals throughout the world are blessed when they put their trust in the anointed one of the Lord. That means the, the Christ. This anointed one is far more than a temporal king of Israel, for throughout the world one may trust in him to be blessed. No temporal king can say or do that, nor can the wrath of God over a king, nor can the wrath of a king, rather, over all the nations of the earth be so powerful unless he is God himself. This reminds you in future history, the seven-year tribulation period, when Christ comes again his second coming, to begin at the end of that seven-year tribulation period to establish his rule. And the all, all the kings of the world rise up against him who don't believe in him. Compare Psalm 45, 6 to 7. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. The scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. <clears throat> and there's another one, Isaiah 6 to 7. For a child will be born to us. Israel, verses 1 to 5, to us, Israel. A son will be given to us, Israel, and the government will be resting, will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace, of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So we have that. That's amazing. Right there, Israel, the coming of the Lord, second coming. Old Testament scripture spoke in ancient times of a Messiah Savior who would be born as a child of, and be God and man at the same time. The prophet Isaiah verifies that a Messiah Savior would be born of Israel, who is mighty God and everlasting Father, who could only be then be God himself as there are no other gods. I remember sharing this with a Jehovah Witness that I got to be friendly with way back when I worked at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport uh, for Sky Chefs. And we talked, and I brought that open. And he says, oh, no, no, that doesn't mean uh, everlasting father. Well, the words say that. He says, oh, no, no. And 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 it was mighty God and everlasting father and uh, mighty God. Well, he says, see, they just look at the words, and they re-engineer what they mean. And then he never spoke to me again. He said, well, I, I didn't write the words. Let's, let's just take a, oh, no, no. That was it. I saw the back of his heels. We're done. Jesus, Jesus, Hebrew, Yeshua, refers to God the Son's name in his first coming to die for sins. Did I miss it? No, Old Testament scripture spoke in ancient times of a Messiah Savior who would be born as a child and be God and man at the same time. Okay, I covered that. The prophet Isaiah verifies that a Messiah Savior would be born of Israel, who is mighty God and everlasting Father, who could only be then be God himself, as there are no other gods. I mentioned that to the my Jehovah Witness friend, too. Boy, he, he just almost had, did a track, a hundred-yard dash, away from me. So, Jesus, meaning Hebrew, in the Hebrew, Yeshua, refers to God, the Son's name, in his first coming to die for sins. The name means Jehovah the Savior, or the sa salvation of Jehovah, or Jehovah is salvation. Compare Matthew 121. So, passages with the phrase Christ Jesus, such as Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, stress the exalted and anointed Son of God who graciously em emptied himself of, i.e., set aside, emptied, meaning set aside his divine prerogatives and, and the exercise of that great Authority, uh, unlimited authority to humble himself and limit himself in his behavior as human and die on the cross, adding to himself the form of perfect humanity so as to take upon himself the penalty, penalty of sins of the whole world by dying in the, on the cross. Fix that, on the cross. 